Hello, Mineral Point students. Uh, welcome to your lesson on the cell cycle. Uh, this is from Chapter 5, Section 1. Uh, you'll be responsible for the material in this tomorrow in class, so please uh, follow along carefully, take notes as you wish, and let's proceed. So, like any organism or anything alive, uh, there is a life cycle, and cells go through a similar thing. And it is called the cell cycle. If you look at this diagram over here on the right, you can see that cells start very small and they grow and they decide whether to uh, go on to the end of their life. And if they do, they go through a cell division process. The cell prepares to divide and then it actually divides into two new cells, which start this cycle all over again. We can divide this up into separate stages as there's major activity that happen in each one. The name of the stages are GAP1 or G1 synthesis or s gap 2 uh, which is known as g2 and mitosis which is known as m sometimes the mitosis stage will actually have two separate stages and we will learn a lot more about this stage of the cell cycle uh, in more detail later on all right so just like any cycle uh, it starts at one point and ends at the next point and it starts the process all over again We'll look at each step in a little bit of detail here. First one, gap one, the very first stage in the uh, cycle of the cell, um, is where the cell goes through its initial growth. Remember, it started off very small at the beginning of the cell cycle and needed to grow. Uh, this is where the cells are going to carry out their normal functions, where if you are a, a muscle cell, a brain cell, a stomach cell, you're going to do your normal processes. A stomach cell will make acid during this process. A muscle cell will create movement during this process. A skin cell will make pigments and, and turn tan during this process. So anything a cell normally does will happen during G1. Uh, near the end of G1, there's a checkpoint. When the cell has grown to a certain size, the cell must pass certain criteria if it is going to continue on with its life cycle and go into the process of cell division. And this whole process is called gap one. Uh, we'll talk about length of time for this to take place, but this uh, this is the portion that actually varies the most. And this can be a very short uh, stage or it can be a very, very, very long stage. After G1, we go on to the next stage, which is called synthesis, or S. Uh, the synthesis, uh, the word synthesis, if you remember from our last chapter, referred to putting things together. And in this case, what's being put together is this stuff over here on the right side, DNA. It is during the S stage that the DNA is copied and replicated so that each new cell will have a full set of instructions um, once the cell divides. DNA carries all the codes, all the information for what the cell needs to do, and it's important that each new cell has a full copy of that. S stage helps to make sure that that takes place. After the S stage, uh, the cell is going to have two identical copies of its DNA. And if you look at this diagram here, this model, you can see they are exactly the same for each of these two new replicating, synthesizing pieces of DNA. And that's important. Each of the new cells, you want to have the exact same set of instructions so that they function just like the original cell did. And that's where that takes place. Synthesis is the place where the DNA is copied. Our next stage is called G2 or GAP2. And after synthesis, we have an additional growth stage. The cell doesn't really grow that much. Uh, it may increase the amount of cytoplasm inside of the, uh, the cell membrane. It'll increase the number of organelles slightly. And basically, it's just kind of making sure, are we ready to go through division? Uh, any last-minute preparations? Is there enough mitochondria to go around? Is the cell large enough to handle a division? Is the DNA in good shape? All those things that a cell would want to check on before it divides, it goes through in gap two. Uh, at the end of gap two, G2, there is a second checkpoint where all criteria must be met before it can go on. If it doesn't meet those criteria, the cell will never advance and never actually go through the division process. So until all those criteria met, things like cell size and, and number of organelles and things to make sure the new cells are going to have everything they need to survive, um, they have to have all that in place before they can go on. And so that's that checkpoint at the end of gap two. So at the end of gap one and gap two, um, there are certain kind of rules that have to be followed in order for them to go on to the next stage. All right, so gap two is this initial or final preparation stage right before the cell divides, make sure everything is perfect. Once the criteria for gap two have been met, we go on to the stage called mitosis. Mitosis actually refers to the process of dividing the nucleus. 
into two equal parts and making sure that each new nucleus has a full set of the DNA and a full set of the instructions. Also included in this model with mitosis is a process called cytokinesis, and it's actually a separate process where the cell itself is divided, and the cytoplasm is separated into two equal portions, and the organelles are kind of divided up, and all that happens in this process called cytokinesis. They're lumped together because they do happen at the same time. This cell on the right, which is dividing, is probably going through mitosis, and also you can see is already starting to divide the cells. So they do kind of happen at the same time. So that's why they're kind of put together, but they are two separate stages, uh, mitosis and cytokinesis. At the end of the M stage, and we will learn a lot more about the processes here as the week goes on, but at the end of the M stage, we're gonna have two identical daughter cells. Daughter cells are the names for these new, um, brand new cells from the, the process of cell division that will be identical to each other both genetically and in size and in shape. And they'll also be identical to their original parent cell before it went through the, all the G1, S, G2 phases. It would be exactly the same as that original parent cell. If it is, then it has been done right. If there is difference, if there are differences there, uh, something has gone wrong. And so the whole goal of mitosis is to end up with two new identical daughter cells that are identical to each other and to their parent. And that is the process of the cell cycle. So um, what regulates how fast this cycle goes? For some cells, this is a process that may only take a few hours. For some, it'll take a few days. For some, it may take years. And, and some may um, actually not go through it at all at a certain point in their lives. Not all cells go through the cycle at the same rate. Some factors that would influence that would be the type of cell that it is. Skin cells will go through this cycle every two weeks because skin cells get rubbed off all the time. They need to be replaced. And so they have to go through this quite often. Liver cells, which are inside the body, well protected there, only go through the cycle about once every year. Um, things like the, the need to replace damaged cells might be a factor in how fast that process takes place. Um, the age of an individual will also affect the rates of this. A young person will go through the cell cycle much faster than a, a person who is older. Elderly people don't heal injuries nearly as fast as young people because their cells simply don't divide as fast to replace those that were damaged. A sprained ankle at age 16 heals much differently than a sprained ankle at age 60. And the reason is the rates of cell division have slowed as the person ages. Those are two factors. Other factors uh, might include the amount of certain hormones in the body. The body produces hormones which will help speed up or slow down cell division rates. One in particular is called HGH, human growth hormone, which is made by the human pituitary gland, affects the rates which cell go through the cell cycle. The more human growth hormone you have, the faster your cells divide. And as a result, the more growth that the person would actually have. So it makes us grow taller when we're going through a growth spurt. Um, some cells will actually reach a stage in their lives where they will now no longer divide. And the ones in particular we're talking about here are brain cells and spinal cord cells. When they reach a certain point in their life, they no longer actually go through cell division. And they go into a stage we call the G0 stage where they may never divide again. And that's why uh, injuries to the brain, injuries to the spinal cord are more or less permanent. Um, it's one of the things scientists are trying to work out if they could figure out how to get some of these cells to go out of G0, go back into G1 and divide again, they could maybe fix some damage to say a spinal cord that's been injured and could fix something like paralysis or could fix some brain damage um, from an injury. Uh, as of right now, they haven't had a lot of luck with that and the cells are still pretty much stuck in this G0 state. Um, so those are some factors that would um, affect the rates of the cell cycle, the type of cell that it is, uh, the age of the person, the type of the hormones in the body, and whether or not they would be a special cell like a brain or spinal cord cell would influence how fast the cell cycle goes. What are some reasons why cells divide? Why don't cells stay as an individual cell? Why do they have to go through this process? Well, one of the reasons are to replace the damage or, or lost cells um, that naturally occur. We get injured, we damage our cells, cells wear out, and they need to be replaced. Uh, another reason is to help organisms to grow. As organisms get bigger, they add more cells to themselves. Um, a big organism is large, not because it has bigger cells, but because it has more cells. The only difference in between a blue whale and a human being is that a blue whale has many, many more cells than the human. The cell size is roughly the same. 
Also, uh, we have cells divide so that the cells can specialize. In our bodies, we have muscle cells and brain cells and nerve cells. If we were one single cell, the idea of specialization of, of tasks wouldn't be wouldn't happen. And so we, we divide our cells up so they can specialize and each do different jobs. And also, sometimes cells get too big for its own good, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, there is a limit to how big cells can get. Uh, once a cell gets too big for its own, own good, it actually starts to die because it has grown too large. All right, let's talk about that a little bit. So why can't a cell be as large as a person? Why don't we have cells the size of even the size of a football or the size of a watermelon or the size of a baseball? Um, the largest cells are, are microscopic in size. Why? Well, um, cell size is mostly limited because the surface area to volume ratio, which is kind of a complicated idea, but we'll, we'll talk about it here in a sec, um, increases, uh, decreases as the cell um, gets bigger. So the ratio becomes smaller as the cell gets larger. Um, this is due to the fact that the cell's volume is going to increase faster than its surface area. It's kind of a geometry thing, but I'll show you what I mean as we go on. If we think of the surface area as the supply of things for the cell because it's covered in membrane and that's how we get things like oxygen, water, food into the cell. And if we think of the volume as the demand for those things, the machinery in there that needs the oxygen, that needs the water, that needs the food, you can see how these two things need to have a balance. And if one increases faster than the other, that's not going to be the case. As volume increases faster than surface area, the cell starts to starve itself to death. And that is one of the reasons why cells cannot be ginormous. There is a limit to how big they can be. So let's talk about this surface area to volume ratio thing. Why um, does this matter? Well, if we look at three simulated cells, these are cells that are shaped as cubes. If we calculate through using math uh, the size of the surface area, the surface area is calculated by measuring, calculating the area of one of these squares multiplying it by the number of sides on the cube. And so we get 1 times 1, and there were 6 sides, so this cube would have a surface area of 6 units, whatever the units are. We calculate volume with a formula length times width times height, and so if we calculate 1 times 1 times 1, we get a volume of 1 unit. And so in this cell, our surface area to volume ratio would be 6 to 1, meaning we have 6 units of supply of oxygen, food, and water to only one unit of demand for those things. Now the cell grows. Let's say it doubles in size so that it is now a 2 by 2 by 2 cube shaped cell. If we calculate it, this cell's surface area, it is 2 times 2 times the 6 sides, or 24 units. If we calculate the volume, length times width times height is going to equal 8 units, and that will form a ratio if we reduce these to 3 to 1. Now we only have three units of supply to one unit of demand. And that means that the cell is not quite as well supplied and is starting to maybe get a little hungry. Let's say the cell really increases in size and becomes a 6 by 6 by 6 cell. Now if we calculate surface area out and we calculate volume out, you can see that these numbers are equal. They both equal 216 units, which is going to give us a ratio of 1 to 1. Our supply is now equal to our demand. and once we exceed this, once we get over a certain point where the volume is actually bigger than the surface area, the cell is starting to die. So the smaller this ratio, the less well that the cell can supply itself. So the more this close these numbers get, the, the worse off the cell is to supply itself. And then it has a choice. It can either divide or it can die. And so that's why cells are going to go through this thing we call the cell cycle. It's a big driver in making cells divide. Okay, so that is your uh, lesson on the cell cycle. And please feel free to go back, rewind the video, pause it, take notes, uh, come to class prepared tomorrow. We will have a short quiz over this content. And I'll see you then.